Our presentation this morning is I can't breathe. I can't breathe, or in American, I can't breathe, said George Floyd with a big knee of the policeman on his neck. The policeman was probably having a lot of adrenaline in him. It was a very stressful moment. However, it's beyond doubt that the usage of force was exceeded and the poor man died for no reason. This provoked mass demonstrations in the United States of America and the shock waves went around the world, including us here in Australia. Again, mankind commenced talks about the issue of racism. And I think we as the church, we cannot just stand on the side from this issue and not raise our voice. Well, today I would like to bring you a very strong message about Black Lives Matter. We are going to study the text which has been used for hundreds of years, even thousands of years, to justify black slavery, to justify racism, and you'll be surprised to discover that racism actually as a concept was promoted, preached, and proclaimed by Christians for hundreds of years. And Christians believed they had a biblical mandate for slavery and racism. Do you know which biblical passage was used by the church fathers in the early ages of Christianity? By Christian priests, especially in Western Europe, for hundreds of years later. Even some Protestant reformers believed that African people's slavery was justified by the Bible. Do you know where that passage is in the Bible? Well, today we're going to all study this passage. It's Genesis chapter 9. Would you please open in your Bibles Genesis chapter 9, the first of the five books of Moses. You remember in chapter 6, uh, Noah is giving a command to build an ark. And mankind is given 100, is everything all right? 120 years to change their ways. After that, the judgment comes, the flood. And in the ark, besides all the species of animals, the family of Noah is saved. Noah and his wife, as well, three of his sons and their wives. Eight souls. God had to virtually jumpstart mankind. People have to repopulate the earth made barren by the waters of the flood. And look at what Genesis chapter 9 verses 20 and onwards tell us. And Noah began to be a farmer. And he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk. And became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. 
So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Jephthah, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his, what? Servant, in some translations, slave. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Well, I wish I could live like Noah. So this is just one family story. It is preceded by the words in verses 18 and 19. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So the whole world is populated because of Noah's family. Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. Now let us use the whiteboard and try to draw a very simple picture of the early genealogy. All right? I'll take the microphone and the marker. And if our camera uh, could look at me now, let's look at how the world develops. So there is Noah. It is obvious that you and I are all descendants of Noah, which means that we're all relatives. This is the beauty of the biblical text. We're all related. You are my blood relatives. Everybody. Those who are watching me on the screen, you are my blood relatives. We are all descendants of Noah. Alright? So, the first son is Shem. Alright? The second son is Ham, and he's called the youngest. Alright? And the third son is Jephthah. All right. And there is a little note here in this text that Ham is the father of Canaan. Now, why is it that Canaan is highlighted here in this story? Now, who is the author of the book of Genesis? Moses. Now, Moses is known to us as the great commander of the nation of Israel. He takes them out of slavery from Egypt and then brings them to the promised land, which is populated by Canaanites. All right? So let's uh, all remember that there's Moses behind the scenes. All right? And he is talking about Canaan, and he, uh, because later in chapters 10 and 11, um, the sons of other, uh, the posterity of other sons is going to be listed. But Canaan is highlighted very carefully. All right? Now, what is happening in the family story? Noah is, no, is not a perfect man. And the Bible never hides any shortfalls of any of its heroes. Eve taking the forbidden fruit. Noah getting drunk in his tent. Abraham lying to the Egyptian pharaoh that Sarah was not his wife, but just a sister. David taking Bathsheba and sending her husband to die in the field. The Bible is the most truthful book in the world. So here's Noah, and he is drunk in his tent. Ham walks into his tent and sees that his father is naked, goes back to his brothers and says, Shem, Japheth, dad is drunk and he is naked, and I've seen him. 
We really don't know why why Noah is so, is so outraged when he discovers that Ham walked in his tent and found him, him naked. But we do know that in ancient history, nakedness was a very shameful thing. In fact, you remember uh, the story of the prodigal son, uh, when it says that when the prodigal son is coming back to his father, his father ran to him. You remember that story? To run in those days meant to lift the edges of your garment up to your knees, hold them by both of your hands, and then you could run. Because in the long garment, you couldn't run. You get, would get trapped in your own garment and you would fall. So, no, uh, so the prodigal son's father is lifting his garment, thus exposing his legs, which was a shameful experience. And it's a symbol of the great shame which Jesus bore on the cross because Jesus was stripped naked. In those times, the cross was not just a painful execution with a great loss of blood, excruciating pain and... Um, uh, and the inevitable death. The cross was also a great theater, a spectacle for the people to see someone who was stripped naked. In those times, it was very shameful to strip a woman naked. But it, it, was, it was even more shameful in those times to undress a man, because that was the patriarchal age. Bear in mind, a man is in the center of everything. And we know that... Uh, there was even punishment prescribed in the Torah, like if you read Leviticus, which says, he who exposes his father's nakedness, and then there's punishment. He who exposes his mother's nakedness, and then there are consequences. People were not supposed to engage in those things. Some liberal interpreters uh, suspect that Noah was outraged not because of uh, Ham actually seeing him naked, but some liberal interpreters think that Ham could have engaged himself in a sexual contact with his father. We really don't know. Uh, that is an exaggeration, and we don't have su su sufficient grounds in the text. Uh, however, some uh, people uh, try to elaborate on this text, and they say, well, there must have been something more than just seeing the father naked. We're not going to take that interpretation. We're going to just to stick to the text, and then I will show you the following meanings. Now, Shem and Jepheth, as you see, they uh, demonstrate modesty. They walk into the tent backwards. They gently approach their father. They put something on, on the top, and only after that, they try to wake him up and tell him what happens. So that's the family story, the family conflict. Uh, and Noah is very unhappy, and he's giving his blessing to these two sons, but the third son is getting a curse. And it's interesting that the consequences will last for generations because it's not only Ham who is having a problem, but also his son, Canaan, would be in the same loop. Maybe Canaan was present, maybe he accompanied Ham, and that is why he's mentioned here in the curse. But let's read the blessings and curses of Noah again and see how this was interpreted throughout history. Because a lot of people take it as a prophecy, and it is. And let's look at the interpretation. So Noah awoke from his wine, verse 24, and knew what the youngest son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Hanan. A servant of servants, he shall be to his what? Brothers. All right? So Canaan... And in this uh, case, some believe that Ham is also called Canaan. So Canaan and, and Ham is the same person in this text. Okay, so Ham will be a servant to his brothers. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And uh, so it is considered widely that Shem would be the father of the so-called Semitic nations. Have you ever heard about this? All right, And we have good grounds to believe this, because from the line of Shem, you come to Abraham. And from Abraham, you come to Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob becomes Israel and the father of the Jewish nation. And Abraham also becomes the father of the Arabs, through Ishmael. 
So we have enough grounds to believe from the biblical text that Shem is the father of the so-called Semitic nations. And the Bible says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And we know throughout history that it is through the line of Shem that the knowledge of the one true God was preserved. All right, it would be the Semitic nations who would not worship multiple gods, but who would worship the one true God. At the same time, a lot of nations around them would be pagan and worship the forces of nature. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And may Canaan be his what? His servant. All right, so Canaan will be the servant of Shem. Now, some people throughout history said, well, Ham is the father of the African nations. And that became a tradition in the biblical interpretation that the descendants of Ham are, in fact, African people. And, uh, well, some people who read this text said, well, the Bible clearly mandates that Ham, or Canaan in this case, and his son Canaan will be a servant to Shem. This means it is okay to have African people as servants and slaves. Do you see where the logic is coming from? All right. Let's look further. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his what? Servant or slave. So, uh, in early Christian history, from uh, the days of the church fathers, even the early fathers, the second century, the third century, some people believed that Japheth, in fact, is the father of most nations of the world. Some people believe that the so-called Indo-European family of nations are the descendants of Shem, of Japheth. And uh, because the Lord said, well, may God spread Japheth, it means that Japheth will be spread all over the world. So the Semitic nations are linked to the Middle East. The Jephethites populated most of the world. And the Hamites, uh, they are the African people. And the Bible mandates that the African people will be servants of Jephethites and Shemites. With this in mind, black people's slavery was justified based on the biblical text. With this in mind, people were sold, stolen. Great wars were wa waged in Africa. The pioneers from Europe who went to Africa to bring the Christian message, like David Livingston, the great doctor, they tried to give the love of Christ to the African people. Did you know that when Livingston died, he was actually hand-carried across Africa by his African friends? than to be given to the sailors to be shipped, to be buried back in England. That's how popular he was, because he brought Christian love. But then came the slave traders. They also considered themselves to be Christians. And they also said, we stick to the text. The text says it is okay for the Hamites to be the servants of the Shemites and the Jephethites. It is okay to sell them for money. That's how a slave trade developed and was justified in Christian circles. It was therefore okay in the minds of many people in North America. Uh, let's travel, uh, say, to Georgia, one of the greatest slave states in the United States of America uh, 200 years ago. There would be a farmer in Georgia, a Christian farmer. On Sunday, he would go to church and he would worship the Lord and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 
was blind, blind, but now I see. He would be so thankful to the Lord that he was saved by grace. And then he would come home and his wife would say, well, look, we are barely coping with our big farm. Let's go to the market and buy a few slaves. And they would go to the market and buy slaves and uh, put them in a shed where they could sleep. Those people were transported from Africa by the slave traders. And the next Sunday they would come back to church and say, say, Oh Lord, thank you very much for all these slaves. Now it's easier for us to work on the farm. Some of those lords and farmers were kind people. They treated those people nicely. But we know from history that unfortunately the vast majority of those slaves were greatly mistreated, oppressed, punished, and even killed. No wonder why this became one of the many issues be between North and South in the United States and sparked the one and only civil war which liberated the African-American people. And slavery was finally abolished. But racism was still there. Afro-American people were still not allowed to go to some places in some states of America where white people went. No wonder why Martin Luther King arrives just 50 years ago and starts preaching all over the United States that black people are equal with the white people. He paid his, with his life for what he believed. The great American doctor Ben Carson, an Adventist doctor, and as you know, a presidential candidate in the United States in 2016, a neurosurgeon, one of the best in history, he said, when I opened the skull of the white man, and when I opened the skull of a black man, inside their brain looks the same. We know that Ben Carson is a bright example that human mind, intellect, intelligence, and many attributes are not distinguished by your skin color. We know that around the world, though apartheid is already gone in South Africa, in America, generally speaking, racism was greatly suppressed in the past decades after Martin Luther King. But we know that skin color is still influencing the people's relationships and attitudes. And the death of George Floyd in America is a bright example of it. Uh, remember, years ago, my friend, Pastor McGee, uh, from the United States, he spent years and years in Pakistan uh, as a Christian missionary. And he told me that in some places in Pakistan, uh, when they arrange for a marriage and the parents meet, they put the bride and the groom next to each other and they look at the color, at the color of their skin. And if the skin of the bride is more fair than the skin of the groom, then the groom is to pay the ransom for the bride. But if the bride is more dark than the, uh, than the groom, then it's the parents of the bride, uh, of the groom, who, uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, if the, groom, if, if the bride is darker, then she pays the ransom for the groom. So the skin color identifies who pays the ransom. Years ago, when I traveled to India with a Christian mission in 2006 to the state of Andhra Pradesh, and I went to the Indian villages, we evangelized an area uh, uh, with 11 villages, and we had uh, 1,600 people coming to our meetings, and we had 1,305 people baptized as a result of that mission. We had 11 churches established. And uh, I remember when we went to... Uh, those villages, I visited in two weeks over 400 Indian homes. Uh, every morning we would spend five, six hours visiting people, and in the evenings we would run the mission. People would be brought by the big trucks. And uh, having this experience in India, exposing myself to the community, I heard from the Indian people of how skin color is uh, made important even in India. People pointed to me, they said, look at our villages. If when you enter the village, there's always a god, a statue at the, uh, at the entrance to the village. And uh, wherever you go, every 
town, village, or city, well, uh, everywhere you go, there would be gods, Hindu gods. And the people said, look very carefully, what color are they? They were bright white color. Because the white color is the symbol of divinity. In some Hindu tradition, white people have a supremacy because of the color of their skin. That, that makes them more divine. All right? That brings them closer to God. Even in the caste system, which is still uh, prominent in the Hindu societies, uh, you know, there are many castes. Uh, the top caste is the Brahmins, the priests. And the bottom caste, they, are, they don't even belong to a caste, so they're untouchables. You will notice that, generally speaking, the distinction between different castes is identified by your skin color, because the Brahmins, they're the people who have skin which is more fair, and the untouchables are the ones who have the darkest skin. All right? So this means that the skin color still plays a role in who you are going to be in some areas, not everywhere, but in some areas of the Hindu society. You remember why Mahatma Gandhi became such a legendary figure in India? He, being a person from the higher caste, went and slept with the untouchables. He wanted to show all Indians that before God, skin color doesn't matter. In fact, Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi, the great prime ministers of India, died because of their stand against racism within the caste system. Many people, Martin Luther King and many others, paid with their lives trying to fight prejudice. But my brothers and sisters, today I'll be very honest with you. This prejudice doesn't come to us just from somewhere from some unknown areas. It comes because of the misinterpretation of the Bible by Christians throughout the ages. Because Christians took the interpretation that Ham is the father of the African people, and therefore he should be the servant to his brothers. Therefore God himself ordained the African people to be our servants. Well, this is a myth. The Bible says that Ham is the father of whom? Of Canaan. Where did the Canaanites live? They lived where Israel is today. All right? So most likely, if you were to dig deep into human biology and ethnography, the spread of nations, the African people, just like everybody else, are the children of Japheth. All right? So the Indian people are the children of Japheth. African people are the children of Japheth. Europeans are the children of Japheth. We're all brothers and sisters. That's number one. Number two, the Canaanites are long gone. They no longer exist. Okay? And thirdly, Noah was talking about his family. He never said that Canaan and his descendants will be the servants of Shem and Japheth forever for the generations to come. It was just an immediate family matter. God never meant for Canaanites to be the slaves of these people. Do you see how an inflamed and exaggerated interpretation of the Bible could influence people's minds and impact nations, lives, people throughout the ages? So here we are to proclaim another truth. Now let's go to the New Testament. Galatians 3. Here we are as the church proclaiming this on YouTube today. And I'm asking everybody to pass this link to people who've been affected by the issue of racism. Galatians 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in 
Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Isn't this beautiful? My brothers and sisters, all of us, African people, Indian people, Sri Lankan people, Italians, English, and even the Russians, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Because the death of Christ is putting slavery behind, is putting gender inequality behind. The death of Christ and his resurrection bring us all together into unity in Christ Jesus. And that is my voice to all of you. I'll conclude with a little story. Let me tell you that I realize it's not an easy issue. And for many of us, it's very difficult to embrace this because we've been grown in it for generations. The Cold War, which lasted for decades in the 20th century, uh, did greatly impact us and uh, did polarize the world. I remember a number of years ago, I took an Australian team to uh, Ukraine to run an evangelistic program, and we flew from Sydney to Kuala Lumpur, and from Kuala Lumpur to Frankfurt, and then from Frankfurt to Kiev. But we stayed for a few days in Germany. And uh, I remember, and I, by that time, had already been an Australian citizen, and uh, as we arrived in Frankfurt, and we were going to pass through the German border, I told my friends, I said, well, you folks go first, because I'm going to get stuck at the border. You'll see. They said, why would you get stuck? I said, well, because of my Russian background, you'll see what happens. They, uh, so they, they pass one after another. The German officer takes their passport, stamps, welcome to Germany, stamps, welcome to Germany. Then I arrive and give my passport. The German officer looks at me, reads my name in the passport, looks at me again, says, well, sir, can you please give me the documents so that you'll uh, leave Germany very soon? All right. Do you have insurance? Okay, here's my insurance. Uh, do you have a letter of invitation to Germany? And he started asking me all sorts of questions. And my team is on the other side waiting for me, and I'm stuck. And then the German officer says, well, I see you've got an Australian passport, but you look Russian. And uh, <laughs> I smiled at the German officer. I said, well, did you know my grandfather was here years ago <laughs> during the Second World War? Uh, and so uh, at the end, I, uh, we I and the German officer laughed. So he gave me a stamp. And uh, as I walked in, my Australian team said, well, Vadim, look, <laughs> Naomi Brazier, one of our ladies from the church, she said, Vadim, I was stunned how much time you spent there at the, at the passport with. I said, well, do you see we're still getting impacted by the results, not only of the Second World War, but of the Cold War. Because uh, in the Western countries, some people still believe that if you travel to Russia, bears walk in the streets. That's what they told Boris Johnson when he traveled to Moscow. Just be careful, because bears may walk in the streets of Russia. And uh, when Russians come, they bring danger with them. There's something in them, you know, and as if there's dynamite put in their stomachs. And you can find this elsewhere. Take the Arabs. I remember when the Lind Cafe siege happened years ago in Sydney. It was a very sad, sad experience. When, an, uh, when a Muslim radical took the lives of innocent people. I have a friend in Sydney, he's an Arab, and he told me, Vadim, I went to work next, uh, next day to my office, and it's a big office. And I was, uh, as I was walking around the offices, there was silence. And people were looking at me. I had a feeling that I was the one who sieged the Lind Cafe. It's hard for us to separate nationalities and evil actions. Nationalism, racism, they are a problem, my brothers and sisters. The Cold War mentality is a problem. The white supremacy mentality is a problem. Uh, I was stunned when I heard that when COVID-19 commenced in Australia, here in Melbourne, a lot of people refused to see the Chinese doctors. They stopped seeing them because they thought, and in hospitals, some people refused uh, the treatment by Chinese nurses. It's here in Melbourne. My brothers and sisters, may I lift a very strong and powerful voice 
against racism, all, kind, all kinds of racial discrimination, nationalism, and other forms of mentality who judge people based on their skin color and nationality. May I appeal to all who are hearing me today, those present and those who see me in, uh, in the invisible audience, that we as the Church aim to make our family the strongest, the most powerful, the friendliest, and the mo most loving family in the world. That whoever comes here, regardless of how he looks, will find love and acceptance. At the end of the day, Jesus said, people will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love amongst yourselves. Black lives matter. Let people who come here say, I can breathe. Here, where Christ is proclaimed, I can breathe. Let us pray. Father in heaven, today as the church, we want a breath of fresh air coming to us from the gospel. Please, Lord, liberate our minds from any hints or features or traits of racism or nationalism. Make us a strong family in Christ, full of love, compassion and care. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, my precious audience, and I'll see you very, very soon.